tuning in to the World XP Podcast. If you're enjoying the content, please remember to drop a sub, drop a like, and leave your thoughts down below in the comments. With that, we will see you guys in the podcast. Greg, welcome Thank to you the World XP me. Podcast. Yeah, of course. It's uh, I saw all your Instagram posts, so all like the last years and all sorts of stuff. And all you've been doing is holding birds that could probably kill me and uh, <laughs> and and all sorts of other animals. And so, you know, when you're little and you go to the zoo and you see the person behind the behind there holding or working with whatever the animal is, you're like, how do you even get there? So I was like, let me see how Greg did that. <laughs> and now here we are. Here we are. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think the post that you saw most recently was me with the bald eagle, which yes. was uh, actually a big thing to work up to because you have to have um, two years of handling experience for birds of prey before you can actually handle a bald eagle at any facility that well, you work course, at. Of course, it's because... America's bird. You're right. <laughs> it's the nation's bird. So you can't mess around with that or anything. Um, and they, I... So one thing that happens with the birds that we have, a lot of people don't know that a lot of the birds that we have are rescue and rehab birds. So they come to us from rehab facilities and they weren't able to um, be released back out into the wild because of injuries that they sustained or anything. So then they join us to be used for educational purposes for their species and other birds. Um, and so we have stress signs that we look for when we're handling animals on programs to make sure that they're okay that they're okay with the situation if there's any stress sign that they're showing we remove them from the situation because we don't want to be stressing them out obviously yeah, so of one of those things is called baiting for our birds which is they basically um fall off your glove and they're just kind of like hanging there and they usually self-correct themselves but a lot of the birds that we have can't fly because of their injuries so that's what they do and after I actually took that picture and I was walking the bald eagle limb back to her area, we were walking through a doorway and she, you know, fell off my glove. And when she fixed herself, got back up on her, my glove, one of her feet was like right on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I didn't think about it that much in the moment, but I like, after I put her back, I was like, that could have been a lot worse than what yeah. actually happened. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, so I want to take a step back real quick yes. before we get into the more nitty gritty. And for the people listening, what is it that you actually do and how do, and more broadly, I guess, after describing that, how does the behind the scenes of a zoo actually work? Cool. So I am a zookeeper at the Little Rock Zoo in Arkansas. Um, I work in the ambassador department. So I work with animals that get used for educational programs. So it's funny that you bring up behind the scenes stuff because the majority of my animals actually do live behind the scenes and people only do see them if we bring them out for programs or encounters like that. Um, we have three different sections in our ambassador department. So we have a heritage farm um, that has goats, sheep, horses, many horses, um, chick, uh, coop with chickens. And for some reason we have flamingos down there. I don't know why flamingos got stuck in the farm area. Don't ask me. Um, and then we have penguin area. So we have 18 penguins and then we have our amphitheater and mew, which is where we keep our birds of prey, small mammals and some reptiles, mostly snakes. Um, so we basically a day daily routine for us is depending on what section you're in for the day you do all the cleaning that you have to do for that area and then depending on what section you're in your day looks different after that so with penguins we have um, two public feedings that happen at 9 30 and 3 30 for the public to see while they're out on, out on exhibit um, we do keep track of how much they eat so we um, hand feed them for that um, for the farm it's our most kind of intense one because you're doing all your raking all your shoveling all that stuff um it's a lot of just raking up and scooping up poop um and cleaning up poop in all the areas <laughs> making diets giving meds a lot of our animals are older so we do have some animals that are on kind of like pain management meds or um supplements as well for anything that they could have um and we work from 7.30 or 4.30 a day. So because we're mostly behind the scenes, once we get through everything, if we're able to, we do try to bring some of our animals out to just be around the zoo. We do training every day as well with our animals to keep them stimulating and we'll do those publicly sometimes too. Nice. So 
do you go back and forth between all three houses in the in the ambassador program? I do. So it's actually only me and my boss who are the only ones who are trained to work all three areas. Um, all of my other coworkers, either all of our farm keepers are mostly only farm keepers because it's the biggest section. Um, but with penguins and our amphitheater section, they're kind of small. So like every day, there's only one person working penguins, whereas for amphitheater, there's usually two keepers up there who work it because you can spread out more. Um, but I work all three. So I do penguins twice a week amphitheater twice a week and then farm once a week oh so you get the good stuff you don't i do show up. <laughs> you don't have to show up poop that much yes. okay so so how do you guys fit into the rest of the zoo right because you've got like well i don't know what my in my head the example that i would use is the national zoo in dc mm -hmm. um so they've got like the like the monkey house i forgot what it's actually called primate house probably and then uh -huh. they've got like the big mammal house where the elephants and like the things like that are and, yeah. then, and then the big cats right obviously is people's a lot of people's favorite um yeah. so how do you guys fit into the rest of the zoo because there's sections like yours that are at like bush gardens for example yeah it's mm -hmm. just like it's just the amphitheater and then they've got like two wolves for some yeah. reason um <laughs> are they used to i don't know if they still do but um so how do you guys fit into the rest of the is it a big zoo like the national zoo or how do you guys fit in with like the zoo i guess it's Econ it's economy I don't know. <laughs> ecosystem that's a great way to put it. um it's smaller than the national zoo for sure um i was down at the new orleans zoo for a couple of years and that one was like 50 something acres and when i was um interviewing for this current position my current my now boss was telling me that like our zoo is like half that size so definitely smaller than the national zoo we don't have pandas or anything like that um but we have we have basically all of the main big animals that you'll find at zoos besides giraffes. We don't currently have giraffes because their exhibit was just not suitable for them anymore. So they had to be sent out. Um, and so we are city owned, which means construction takes an extra amount of time as well. So um, one day giraffes will come back, but not anytime soon. But we have, um, so like I mentioned our amphitheater, our amphitheater and mew are behind the scenes, but our penguin area and our farm are open to the public. So penguins, they can walk around the exhibit and see the penguins if they're out on exhibit. The farm, they can actually walk through both of our barns that we have. Um, the animals have inside stalls and then outside like big yards and everything. Um, but we, we're kind of spread out. So we're the most spread out department in the zoo just because we have the three different sections. So like our farm area is down by, I don't know if this was great plan, but it's down by kind of like bears and like small carnivores and everything. That um, seems like a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's enrichment, you know, giving them smells in the air and everything. <laughs> um, our penguin area is kind of near the front. So it's by some of our primates and then um, our amphitheater is behind the scenes, but we do have like an actual amphitheater where we do our educational shows at. So that is where we will bring like animals out on a stage for like shows over the weekend um, if we're doing anything like that. Gotcha. Wild. <laughs> literally. Well, literally. literally. <laughs> yeah. So, hmm. so when you bring them out for shows, right? You mentioned like. I think a lot of the other places that have birds of prey, specifically the big, because their range is so big when they're healthy and they're in the wild, they fly yes. from, I don't even know. But so it, it's, it makes sense that a lot of them are injured. And I remember hearing that when I was at other places. But yeah. so when you, so like when you bring them out to, well, I guess, hmm, I guess there's, there's like two parts to this question. Mm -hmm. One, birds of prey, because they're, I think they're cool, but also, when what is the capability like the capabilities are lacking so you're not as concerned obviously the the talons are still sharp and the beak yeah. is still is still sharp but mm -hmm. you're kind of less concerned because if you're like i remember being little and i was like oh my god that dude is holding up like peregrine falcon like those things are <laughs> fast but like you don't know it can't fly yeah which is like you know that makes it a lot safer i guess yes. uh -huh. so 
how limited are the capabilities? And then like you mentioned, when they like fall over and then they correct, but like, so are you just kind of chilling there and the glove is basically just to protect the talons. And then aside from that, it's fine. Like if the talons weren't sharp, like, like hypothetically, you could just have it sit there and it would be fine. Yeah. uh Uh-huh. So we, um, we have our smallest bird that we have is a, um, an American kestrel and they're, um, just, they're the smallest falcon species in the U S. Um, he's like maybe that big. Um, and so like every now and then I always think about, I'm just like, do I really have to wear a glove? Will I bring something that small? Cause they have talons, but they're, they're very, they're almost like cat nails on them. Mm-hmm. You know, they're mm-hmm. very skinny, but they are still birds of prey. So, um, they still use them to kill things. They still use them to hunt things and everything. Um, but it kind of just depends on the bird. So we have different birds that have different injuries um or limitations so like i mentioned with our bald eagle she can't fly um so we have the glove on for protection for us obviously um but when we bring them out you really are just standing there like i mentioned we look out for stress signs so for them the begging can be a stress sign they pant like dogs do because they can't sweat like humans do um so if they're panting a lot that can be a stress sign and then um they do something where they droop their wings. So it kind of almost looks like they're kind of like folding their wings out and like holding them lower too. And it can be like from stress and from overheating too. So those are the main things we look out for. But as long as, the, as, long as those aren't being shown and we have the proper equipment, we really just stand there with them. We do have some birds that are flagged though. So those birds we only bring out when we have multiple staff members because we will fly them in our areas. So they, that's where the training comes into before we fly any of our birds that can fly. Um, we do a lot of training with them and they start off on something called a creance, which is basically just a really long leash. So they can fly around, but someone's holding on to it the whole time. So they don't technically fly off or anything, but we have a hawk. He is a Harris hawk named Tucson. And he actually flew to the state of Oklahoma one time um during a show or during an encounter so it's possible when they're flagged that you know things can go wrong um but that's just the reality that we live with so um did you get him yeah. back he came back we got him back um we they actually he came back was, by himself well no so it was before i was there but um they actually got so our birds have um kind of like bands around their legs some of them do yeah the tag um, the tagging thing right yes yeah uh-huh. so they were um someone actually found him in oklahoma and actually got in contact with um i think their game and fish area that they have in oklahoma who then got in contact with us because they could tell from the tagging that they were from our zoo um so we were actually able to bring him back but um he uh he doesn't fly anymore um <laughs> <laughs> um But yeah, so we have the gloves and everything. They're on once they all have um, anklets as well on their legs that then they have something called jesses attached to. So they're kind of like little, like almost like drawstrings that go through the anklet. And then um, there is basically a leash that goes through those. And so basically that's the main equipment for birds of prey that you have when you work with them. And you just go into their area, you step them up on your glove and then you kind of wrap those, that leash like around your hand so that like they're secure where they are because they will try to jump around sometimes but it's for their safety that we keep them where they are because like yeah. I mentioned, a lot of them aren't flagged. Um, so it would be dangerous for them to like fall off or go over anything. Um, but yeah, most of the time we're just going out there holding them and it's pretty chill. Um, I have a vulture that bites me a lot when we fly her, <laughs> but it's casual. It, it, would, it, would, it would be the vulture as well. <laughs> it would be the vulture. Yes. That's a very big thing that we talk about too, is that vultures are like that. So, <laughs> yeah. So when you're so like for, you've got like a group of kids or whatever, and you're standing there, is it just basically like you give the spiel of the bird and then kind of what their capabilities are and where they live normally and like all that sort of thing. And then it's kind of like, it's probably what, not a long show, maybe 15, 10, 15 minutes, something like that. Yeah, so it is usually exactly 10 to 15 minutes, um, depending on what the animals we're using are. Um, And we adapt stuff based to what the age range of our group that we're talking to is. So obviously, if you're doing a chat with like 
elementary school kids or preschoolers or something, they're not going to really retain a lot of stuff besides <laughs> what the animal is, what its name is, and like that, what it eats or something like that. And if it is or isn't related to a dinosaur, basically. Um, so we adapt what we're talking about to what our um, guests' age range and our audience is. Um, but we don't do, so some of our animals, like our mammals and reptiles, we do do touching with them. Um, but we don't do that for birds of prey because they're birds of prey. And yeah. they're also pretty fragile too because they have those hollow bones. Um, so it's not comfortable for them at all. But um, we usually just bring them out. We do the talk. If we're doing our amphitheater, we walk them around so people can see them at least up close and then they can come up at the end and see them closer too. Um, but we usually talk about, like I mentioned, we always bring up what they, what kind of species they are, what their name is, how old they are. Um, we bring up like normal kind of facts or really cool facts about them. And then we always try to do a conservation message about it too. So for all of our birds of prey, the main conservation messaging is about how it's illegal to own one, hunt for one. You can't even own a feather from them either because it's illegal. And then we also talk about things. So we have a great horned owl who actually was hit by a car. Um, and that's why he ended up in a rehab facility. It, permanent, it permanently dilated his right eye. So he's actually blind in that right eye now and it caused some neurological damage too. So that's why he ended up with us. And so we talk about not you know, throwing the litter out of your car while you're driving around because that'll attract animals like armadillos, rats that end up being roadkill. And it's a lot easier for a burger prey to go try to eat something that's already dead than having to. Yeah actually hunt it so um they can't get hit by cars by that so we always try to do at least one conservation message too because we want to make sure that people are actually learning about something obviously it's cool to see the animals up close and learn about them still but we also want to make sure that people are learning things that they can do to help them as well yeah for sure that makes sense um but two more questions on this and then we'll okay, move sorry. on <laughs> I had, well the reason that when i was little like super little I think like five or six uh -huh. i asked my parents for a bird encyclopedia for my birthday and i just I spent that. i just spent all of the time looking at the birds of prey i did uh -huh. not care about any of the finches and all uh -huh. the other stuff like, <laughs> and didn't care at all i had uh -huh. like everything bookmarked and stuff i think my parents might have thought i was like autistic or something <laughs> i don't know <laughs> did you ever go burging or anything no no i just really liked the book and like yeah. But it was really weird because I was so young. So I made like my kindergarten teacher, I made her like put her arms out so we could do like the wingspan of an eagle. Uh -huh. And the teacher, I think, thought I was nuts. But that's, we, we moved. But anyway, so that's There's why. There's weirder like, things you could be interested in. So well, <laughs> that's, that's very true. But anyway, so that's why I'm very curious about it. Because I never like, aside from going to one of those shows like you do, I've never actually like spoken to somebody who is like involved with them on a daily basis yeah um so it's very interesting to me have you seen them have you seen a healthy one like hunt before like act, or like actually be a bird of prey if, if that makes sense like it have does you seen make one? sense um yeah. i have never gone like burning myself either but especially down in new orleans like if we would be driving around we would see um these birds that were called their Mississippi kites. And they're kind of like, um, they kind of look like hawks, but they're not mm -hmm. technically yeah. hawks. Um, and I've seen them hunt before. Um, here in Arkansas, we have a lot of vultures. So there's there's a mountain like 15 minutes from my apartment. Like I go hike a lot. And when you get to the top, um, you always see turkey vultures and sometimes some black vultures yeah. up here too. And so if you hang up there long enough, like obviously you don't see them like actually like get mm. what they're going after but i have seen a lot of them like dive before and if a bird of prey is diving like that it's because it found something to hunt um so i haven't really ever seen like the main main process besides like those crazy videos that people mm -hmm. get um they just happen to be in the right spot at the right time um yeah. online but um it's something that i always want to see you know working with them and everything obviously yeah. We have the ones that we have, but we want them all to be healthy. We want them all to be out in the wild and everything. So we want them doing those natural processes. So on like the small chances when you actually see it is kind of like you forget as a zookeeper that you're working with wild animals every single day and how amazing yeah. it actually is. So it's one of those things that kind of like makes you take a step back and like really appreciate stuff again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen um, the apartment I used to live in was right on a 
river, fairly big river. Okay. And there was a, a few osprey nests. Um, and so I saw them dive into the water a couple yeah. of times. Uh -huh. Um, and like the house, I think probably what sparked the interest when I was a kid was there's was a red tail hawk that lived near, that lived near the house. Obviously, yeah, there's vultures around, like they yeah. just do vulture things. They're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, they're everywhere. <laughs> um, but I think the hawk is probably what sparked the interest, but I never saw the hawk, like go find anything. Yeah. Um, and then like, like you read, like I remember reading about uh, falcons were fast and then kites I remember kites and kestrels I remember reading about as well yeah. but then like it goes to where you live and so like where we were there wasn't a big like didn't really see a lot of them around yeah. mm -hmm. I've seen a few bald eagles uh -huh. like when we went out to California uh -huh. um a couple times and I think I don't recall but mostly they're just like sitting there or like yeah whatever mm -hmm. and it's like okay there it is and then we move on like, <laughs> but, but yeah. a lot of people don't realize that like for bald eagles out in the wild mostly eat fish too yes um, so they hang out by water a lot more as well and they're actually pretty lazy so they actually wait for like other birds to start hunting for stuff and then they swoop in after that and start hunting as well <laughs> america's um, bird <laughs> america's bird yeah <laughs> the working class bird you know um uh... But That's yeah, nice. they, uh, it's really funny, like what you learn about them too, just by working with them and stuff. So we have two red tailed hawks as well. Um, one is actually 28, which is really, really old for them. Um, mm -hmm. They can mm -hmm. live up to anywhere from like 20 to 25 years, but obviously in human care, it can be longer because they, we have a vet, we have unlimited food, we have yeah. no predators for them at all. Um, and so she we call her the grandma of our department but like like you mentioned before vultures and then red tail hawks are usually the most like common spread ones um and a lot of people don't know either that falcons are actually the fastest animal in the world too they're actually faster than cheetahs technically as well yeah i remember reading it. <laughs> which i thought was kind of surprising because i don't think a lot of people think of something flying as being technically faster than something that's running so yeah that's why people well, it's, it's the dive it. speed well that's why i asked if yes. you had seen it because i was like yes. have you seen that actually happen i like that'd be something yeah. i really want to see uh-huh our american kestrel that we have he is fully flighted mm -hmm. and so we have to be very careful with him obviously whenever we're going in with him because if he gets out, he's gone because he is a falcon technically. So they, we would never get him back if he ever got away from us, probably. Um, yeah. So we're very careful with him, obviously. So what's his, if he's fully flighted, what's his, why do you guys still have him? So he was um, imprinted. I don't know if you've ever heard about that before. Mm -hmm. um, no. imp imprinting is kind of what it sounds like, but um, birds and, and it's mostly birds, but animals and human care in general can go through this where they basically kind of like, it's not necessarily like partnering up with a human, but it's kind of along the lines of like, they just become really attached to a specific person or oh. a specific like other bird maybe or something that they're with. And then it Is can- Is that like those videos of where like you see in the zoo, like a monkey will be best friends with a panda for no reason? It can be like that. Yeah. Uh-huh. So- our kestrel so when something imprints it can become dangerous to work with the animal because if unless you're like if it if a bird imprinted with like a keeper and only likes that keeper it could be dangerous for other keepers to try to work with that animal because they wouldn't mm -hmm. like react well to the other keepers compared to the one that they imprinted with so usually what happens in situations like that is they get sent to other departments or other facilities so we actually had a Catalina macaw in our department for a while who imprinted with a keeper and she laid like 30 or 40 eggs in the span of like one year, which is a crazy amount um, because she just liked that keeper so much. So it was also becoming a health concern for her too, because she shouldn't be producing that many eggs in the first place. But then birds like macaws, social birds are weird in the first place where they are very particular about people. And so she became even harder for other keepers to work with because of that. So she actually joined our bird department at the zoo. So she's still at the zoo here. We just don't work with her anymore to keep, get her away from that situation. Um, but that's what happened with our Kestrel. He imprinted with someone at the, um, I think it, I don't know necessarily if it was technically out in the wild, like if he was just hanging around an area specifically because of something and it wasn't a good area or if he got brought in 
because of an injury and healed, but then imprinted with someone at the rehab. So could not go back into the wild because of that. But that's why he ended up with us. Mm. So the macaw going into the bird, um, your bird exhibit. Yes. How does that work? Was So like if you've got, so you got other birds, other birds that are just existing already. Yes. Well, I guess, well, I guess the question really is what's the difference between, because a macaw is not, it's not a bird of prey, is it? No. Uh. Uh-uh. So why was that? Was it injured and that's why it was with you guys or like why or why was it with you and not with them in the first place, I guess? So um, it's and kind also, of like, sorry. And also how does that transition work from when you send like that, like, does it take them a while to adapt to being in a new thing? And like, how does, like, is there suitability? Like with this one, you're like, this one will be okay, but maybe yeah. another one won't be. And then like, how yeah. do you deal with that as well? That is a great question. Um, so with the macaws themselves, um, they aren't technically, so they're not birds of prey. Um, all three of the macaws that we currently have now can fly though. Um, and so they're just used for educational purposes. So there are facilities in the country that do breeding work with specific species. So there's actually a place in um I think it's Missouri called the World Bird Sanctuary. So they do a lot of breeding. And since those animals are born in human care, they can't necessarily be released to the wild because they're not a rehab place. They're just kind of like a sanctuary for educational purposes. So we will get birds from other facilities like that that then join our teams for educational stuff. And for ambassador departments, animals can fail out of the program is what we call it. We will call them like failed ambassadors. So um, we will bring new animals in, but if it seems like they're not doing well with the situation, you know, they're not doing well with being, cause like, you know, you mentioned big cats and stuff a lot. Everyone who works with big cats, they work with them in protected situations. So they're never like on exhibit with like a lion, obviously, or something. And even like behind the scenes, they don't go inside their enclosure with them. So if we ever have an animal that is not showing good signs of being comfortable with like a keeper being super close to them, and it's not something we give it a little bit of time, obviously, um, because it is just a desensitization thing as well. Um, but if it just does not seem like it's working out, we will um, move that animal around. So with the macaw that I was talking about, since she imprinted, she when she moved into the birdhouse, she actually lives by herself. So she's in the birdhouse, but she's in her own area in the birdhouse um, because macaws can be kind of crazy. Um, and so like, I don't, I don't necessarily know if we could technically have a macaw in there. Um, and I think it was for her as well. So like, she wasn't born in the Berg house, you know, so she wasn't used to a situation where people could walk in and walk through and everything like the general public and stuff. So um, she's in her own area. So people can't really walk in with her because I think that's what they had decided was most comfortable for her. Um, so we do really just pay attention to the animals. Um, limitations and kind of like what they're showing us and so that's a lot of the big training stuff that we do is to being able to read signs like body language and stuff like that to make sure um we actually just had a porcupine join our department from the zoo down in new orleans actually and um she came from a breeding pair down there so she always lived like with her parents and stuff and she never um was used for educational reasons. She never did any training or anything like that. So she came to us as like a blank slate, basically. So we had to do a lot of work recently of just kind of like going in there and hanging out with her to get her used to being around us. Um, So it kind of depends on what the animal past was like, I guess, technically too. Um, But like I mentioned before, we have those stress signs that we don't want to ever ignore. So um, we will move animals around. Sometimes they'll go even to other facilities too, Mm -hmm. if they're too stressed out. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. Last question on birds, because we've been talking about birds for 30 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) So you mentioned uh, some hawks, vultures, bald eagle, the Mm -hmm. kestrel. Mm -hmm. what else is, is how extensive is it? Do you got how many other birds in there? What variety, et cetera? 
So we have two turkey vulture, or we have one turkey vulture and two black vultures. We have two bald eagles, the one that I was holding, and then we have a male one who's younger, who is actually able to fly. So we will be using him for flight shows eventually. He's just newer to the department. Um, and that was the thing that happened with COVID as well. Programs stopped happening when COVID hit. So if we got an animal in around the time that COVID hit, they weren't really coming out and being used for programs. So the process slowed down a lot. So he was newer to the department, I think like a year or two ago, but he hasn't really been able to do programs yet so everything's kind of slowed down with him um we have two red tail hawks we have a harris hawk we have a barn owl and we have two screech owls as well we have a barred owl and then we have a great horned owl so we have lots of owls as well um and then we have a raven to a white naped raven and then we also have a ground hornbill which looks like a dinosaur basically um so it makes sense as to why birds are related to dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> that is wild. Huge yeah. variety for sure. Yes. Uh -huh. And that's kind of how ambassador departments are. And that's why I like working in them is because you get the variety in species, like, you know, like mammals or birds or anything like that, you know, of reptiles in the first place. But then you get the variety of the specific kind of bird and specific kind of mammal as well, too. Yeah. Okay. So the other, I think... We could probably skip the farm one for this conversation. <laughs> yeah, I it's think... pretty basic. It's all domestic yeah. animals. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay, so the other one is uh, small mammals and something reptiles. else. Or... Reptiles. Okay, yes. so when you're in there, yes. it's it's very different from just holding the thing on your arm, right? So walk us through a little bit of working with, well, I guess snakes would probably be. Anyway, what, what is it like working with those with those animals? So it's the same process when it comes to like the general husbandry stuff of feeding them, cleaning up after them. They just live in different kinds of areas. So um, for mammals, we have three opossums. We have a three-banded armadillo. We have a dwarf rabbit. And then we have that new prehensile tail porcupine and then two ferrets. Um, and so their areas, you know, they don't Bird poop is very different from animal poop, um, and so cleaning's a little bit different. But handling-wise and everything it is different. So we, with the mammals, we try to keep them out of hand if we can because they're usually more active. So you know, like the armadillo that we have, his name is Miguel. He's only about three or four years old, so he's kind of young. So he runs around the entire time. So if we're bringing him out on stage, we'll just bring him out on stage and just stand with him and let him run around on the stage the entire time as long as we keep an eye on him if we're going off site to a program somewhere we might bring like a little like play pen kind of thing with us so that they can still um move around but obviously they're not going to be you know like running under desks if they're at school or something like that um we have tables that we'll bring them out on to so like our dwarf rabbit he does not like to be held so we have a table that we bring out with us and we just put him on there um, so people can come up closer for that too. And then for the reptiles, we have like five or six different kinds of snakes. Um, we have two ball pythons. We have um, a milk snake who is retired. So that is a thing that can happen in ambassador departments when they get too old, um, we will retire them. So they're not used for programming anymore. Um, so he hasn't come out for programming, but he still lives with us. Um, we have a corn snake, we have um, a speckled king snake, we have a rosy boa, um, and then we also have uh, a blue tongue skink as well. Um, so for them, it's all hand handling um, because we do have what are called snake trees that we can use, which are just like things that we create that are just like branches or wood and stuff like mm -hmm. that, that you can bring out with you and just put them on there and they'll just kind of like hang out on there the whole time. Um, so we can get them out of hand if we want to as well. But with a lot of the snakes, it is just kind of holding them the whole time while you're talking about them. And it's different with all those animals too, because they're the ones that can be touched. So if, um, during COVID, we stopped doing touching, obviously, but now that people are starting to act like it's not a real thing anymore, <laughs> um, we, uh, we do some touching. It's still depending on how we feel about the situation, so we don't have to do touching if we don't want to, but if we have a small group or a group that's well-behaved or anything, we will let them come up, so when 
where a whole like with the reptile we'll be holding them while they're touching them um with the mammals it just depends on what we have so like we have two baby opossums who are less than a year old and we hold them still but we have an older opossum who's about a year to just over a year old now and we just let her walk around and hang out so if people come up and touch they touch like while they're on the ground as well do they know when they're on the stage like not or is there like a fence up or do they just understand that that's the barrier <laughs> we've had close calls <laughs> um it, especially with the armadillo he is like uh he's a track star he will run the entire stage the entire time um so we do keep an eye on them we don't have like a fence up on the actual stage but if one of them is getting near like the edge for any reason we will like obviously be very close to them in that situation um if they're getting near the edge, usually I just kind of pick them up and like redirect them kind of. Um, not all of their depth perception is really amazing. So whether or not they can tell that they're about to go off the edge of the stage is another reason why we definitely keep an eye on them in those situations too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you're holding the snakes, this is the, yeah. this is the other thing I... I see people hold these giant snakes and I'm like, why would you do that to yourself? Yeah. Do you yeah. want to get strangled to death? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But people still do it. So yeah. I guess is that part of the training as well? Or is it, or are these snakes kind of not docile? I guess docile could be the word, but they're not <laughs> killers in the same way that like, if you just ran into one in the Amazon, like yeah. you'd, you'd be toast. But yeah. this one is like, I don't know. What, what, like what, what turns it into more docile than the one that's out there? Because it's the same DNA. It's the same it animal. Uh huh. Um, I actually think docile is a really good word to use for it. So I mentioned we have two ball pythons and they are actually kind of seen as like the starter snake for a lot of people if they ever want to have one as a pet because they're bigger, you know, they're a python, they usually get anywhere from about four to six feet long. Um, but they're very chill. Like people will describe them as like the puppy dog of like the snake world, kind of. They just kind of like hang out and everything. They're not super active because they're bigger. Um, so I don't really know if it's necessarily just like natural predisposition the whole time or you know, we get snakes in, so we have a speckled king snake that just came to us from another facility like six months ago or something. Um, and she was an ambassador snake there as well. So her coming to us wasn't a big deal because she had been in hand before she had been used for programs before. But it really is <clears throat> um, kind of the same as like with the birds and stuff. You do still have to desensitize them, even though you are holding them the whole time. We still, you know, for them, they have different stress signs than birds, obviously. So for them, um, they make an S hook with their head if they're getting ready to like bite something. So that would be a stress sign. Going to the bathroom in hand for a reptile is a really big stress sign as well. Um, and then obviously- oh, I'm sure that's fun to get peed on. <laughs> when I worked down in New Orleans, we had a big tortoise who, um, his name was Tank, who every time he got picked up, he would pee on you. So we, um, and it was like a projectile pee too. So like it would shoot back out you. So that was always fun because we would handle them like in the morning and then you get pee gone and just smell like tortoise pee for the rest of the day. Um, but we always smell bad at work as well. So yeah. it just blends in with all the other smells. Um, but going to the bathroom is a big stress sign because they don't go to the bathroom super often, like compared to mammals or anything. So that would be a very big sign. Our skink that we have, um, she used to be in our reptile department at the zoo. Um, and so she actually joined us because they noticed with her over there that she had a very calm disposition. She was, they would bring her out to do random stuff and she was really good in hand. So she joined our department so we could start using her for programs because we didn't have like a lizard or anything at the time. Um, so that they were able to tell just by like getting to know her personality. So even like reptiles will have the, that the general personality about them that kind of makes them you can kind of pick out whether or not um they would be good for stuff like that too so 
I see people like when I lived down in New Orleans, there were people who would walk around Bourbon Street with like ball pythons just hanging around their neck or something. And like, I'm assuming that they were their pets and they were just trying to make some quick <laughs> money by taking pictures with them. Um, but I don't know why anyone would just want to like go walk around and pick up a snake and just hang out with it or anything. Yeah. Now that you mention it, I think I saw I think I saw that. We were down there in really? like February. No, uh-huh. no, maybe maybe it wasn't there. Somewhere in a street like Bourbon Street. Uh-huh. I saw one. Okay. I saw a guy with a snake and Just I was like snake. a big snake yeah. and I was like, yeah, I'm going to the other side of the street. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, um, that's yeah. that's crazy. I've been yeah. bit by a snake before too, so I think like once you get through, like, I've been bit by a snake before. I've been bit by, like, you know, we we work with dangerous animals still technically and everything. Mm-hmm. So all the snakes that we have in our department are not venomous, obviously, because we would not be bringing, we, we don't get paid enough to handle venomous mm-hmm. animals. And we don't, we have good health insurance, but it's not that good or anything. Um, and obviously, it's not safe to handle a venomous animal. So we have venomous snakes in our reptile department and they will um, do venomous handling with them when they need to clean their enclosures and everything, but they're using what are called like snake hooks and like snake tubes and stuff. So they're not actually ever touching the animal. And the snake is like, like, yeah, yeah. they have like hooks on them kind of. And so like, they always like hold them kind of like far out and everything too. So they're never actually close to them either. so technically like if we ever got bit by any of the snakes that we have in our department like yeah it would suck but we're not going to become we're not going to have venom injected into us or anything um and it's just one of those things that you run the risk of having happen but that's why we pay attention to body language so much so that we try to avoid situations like that no that makes total sense a lot of things to look out for for sure Mm -hmm. okay so you okay so i want to backtrack all the way to little greg (laughs) <laughs> actually before we get there uh-huh. when you got into zoo stuff mm-hmm. were you like i want to do the showing part or did you just want to do zoo stuff generally and you at, stumbled into the ambassador part at first i just wanted to do zoo stuff i didn't really know what i wanted to do um i've always really liked primates so i always have thought about like if i worked with a specific like in like an actual specific like set department kind of thing i would want to do primates where it's just like you know a handful of species almost um but when i i didn't do anything zoo related until i was in college um because i grew up in fairfax so i grew up you know going to the national zoo i would go even to the baltimore zoo and everything as well because my mom's from baltimore growing up But I never really looked into like volunteer programs or anything because even those can be kind of competitive to get into as well because like I think it's the National Zoo you have to do like you have to do something for like a year before you can even start like volunteering with them or something like I don't know if it's like classes or something like that. Um, Well it's just the Smithsonian has like they're very prestigious generally so the requirements are different yes different yeah Uh uh-huh um like we have a we have a volunteer program with us but obviously it's not to the same level as the smithsonian because they're in like the top three of zoos every year um and they do lots of amazing work and everything um they have a bigger a bigger production going on um but i started off as an intern junior at the summer after my junior year of college and i honestly at the time when I was looking for internships I was I was deciding between studying abroad for the summer or like for a semester or doing an internship over the summer and I just decided that an internship would probably benefit me more um, like career wise and everything and so I just started looking in like January or February of that year um, and I was a little bit selfish and I only wanted to like intern in a city that I thought would be fun to live in for a summer and everything. So obviously New Orleans is a fun city to live in for a summer. So um, I I don't really remember how many I actually like applied to, um, but internships aren't necessarily, they're competitive in the sense that like, they're still not gonna choose everyone who applies for an internship, but it is still just a volunteer program technically. So um, 
usually you have a bigger chance of getting an internship, but you still have to do like interviews and everything. So I um, chose the ambassador department down in New Orleans just because I thought that would be a good gateway into the field because you get a lot of different experiencing ambassador departments. So like every department does training with their animals, but ambassador departments are one of like the only departments that you actually get like hands-on experience with your animals. Cause like I mentioned, you know, like big cats, primates, big carnivores in general, you work protected contact with them the whole time. So like you can do stuff where, you know, you can train them for voluntary blood draws or stuff like that. And we train for stuff like that by like having them come up to like a mesh fence and like pinching them so they get used to like an eagle going in. So you do get like a little bit of hands-on stuff still, but obviously you're not going to be walking in and doing like hands-on training with a tiger or a gorilla compared to like an armadillo or a penguin or something. So I was drawn to like the more hands-on part of it. And obviously you can tell I'm a talker too. So I, um, I wanted to get into the field as well because I felt like the education part of it was one of the more important parts too, because I do think there is still kind of like a stigma against zoos. It's obviously not as bad as it used to be or anything. Um, but you know, you will just like with anything, you'll have people who don't support um the work that you do or something so there are people who are anti-zoo or anti-aquarium still what is this stigma against zoos and aquariums is it that is it that all the animals should be wild and like that sort of thing yeah so i always try to tell people that we are one of you know there are other jobs like this but we are one of the career paths where we wish we didn't have the job that we had like we wish we didn't have to work the job that we have because everyone wants all wild animals to be out in the wild obviously no one wants like no one wants something like an orangutan or a wolf or anything like that or even just a bird of prey you know in human care but um I mean, we will admit like zoos didn't start off well, you know, they, like the animals used to be at, like behind bars, they used to be in areas like that. And so that created a stigma from the beginning. Um, and I think a lot of people don't realize that like since, I don't know when, but since like the everything kind of changed, like zoos and aquariums are all conservation based and focused now, not just entertainment. So before I would say that like a lot of facilities and stuff were entertainment, like the Little Rock Zoo one of our really old logos was actually had the word live, had the phrase live entertainment in the logo because that's what zoos kind of used to be was it was this thing where people could kind of come and just see this wild animal. They weren't necessarily doing like a lot of work with them. So that definitely created a stigma. But then the continuation of that stigma is people not wanting wild animals to be in human care. So they don't want something like a gorilla being in an exhibit that is obviously like, one sixteenth of the size of the land that it would be on out in the wild or something, which is sad to see, obviously, but something I always tell people too is that a lot of the times out in the wild, the only reason why animals are moving around is because they're hunting. So like a big cat will travel anywhere from 50 to 100 miles a day, but it's only because it's looking for food or water. If it's living in an area that has plenty of food, it has plenty of like shelter and it has like a river or something nearby for water access, that cat's not going to leave that area. It's just going to lay around all day until it has to hunt in that area, but it doesn't have to travel that far. So a lot of people claim that they think animals kind of look like they're depressed in um, human care as well, which is a problem for people to be saying in the first place because it's putting human emotions on something that is not human in the first place. Um, So to me, it always just kind of seems mostly like ignorance, like it's people who don't, actually do the research into like what zoos and stuff do because like I do we tell people that there are still bad zoos and aquariums out there so the Little Rock Zoo is an AZA accredited zoo which means there's an organization called the it's the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and they do an accreditation process so if you are an accredited zoo you have that accreditation it comes into review every five years. So we're getting checked up on every five years and everything to make sure we're still meeting everything, but they create a list of standards for everything. So a lot of people don't realize that 
they might think that like an exhibit for an animal looks small, but if you're at an Craigad Zoo, that exhibit is up to standards that are placed for that animal. So that area is actually the perfect size for them. It has all the components in it that it needs to have in it. It's just obviously never not never ending like it would be out in the wild. Um, but that's why I kind of wanted to get into like the education stuff too, is to talk more about the conservation aspect of it because it's just something that I think gets overlooked because of people not necessarily wanting to do research into it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think a lot of stigmas are based in lack of knowledge generally anyways. Yeah. Um, but this is a good segue actually, because we forgot to talk about the penguins Oh yeah, and the, uh -huh. and the, and the penguin habitat, like the penguins live in very cold conditions and Arkansas is not a very cold place. Yeah. So what is their habitat like in the zoo one and then also what is it like to work with them because you see in right penguins in madagascar right penguins are portrayed as like these goofy like funny sort of thing and then you uh -huh. see them waddle around in real life and it's like uh -huh. yes they are exactly like that it's like <laughs> <laughs> so we have african black footed penguins with us at the zoo so they actually don't live in a cold climate they live um in the southwest coast of south africa so out in the wild they actually live on like beachy and rocky areas so that's what our exhibit looks for them they have a 14 foot deep um pool that's like maybe 30 feet long or something. So they have a really big pool. And then their on onshore area is mostly like rocky kind of like, yeah, like a rocky area. Um, and so they actually do okay in the temperature. Now this week it's like over a hundred degrees every day. So that is kind of hot for them still, but they're from South Africa. So it can get that hot in the wild for them too but we have other things that we do for them so they're a little spoiled and we have misters that we turn on on the exhibit that they can stand stand under and everything but that water that they have is really cold too so it's usually anywhere from like 50 to 55 degrees every day so <laughs> super cold for us um yeah. but perfect for them um so they'll get into the water if they're like too hot or anything and that's how they drink as well just by swimming around um and I, so penguins have always been one of my favorite animals. So getting to work with them kind of this early on in my career was like another reason why I wanted to like move here and start working at the zoo because I have always wanted to work with them. Um, they are very clumsy and they are goofy, but they are also assholes. Um, they will most like nine times out of 10, if I have an injury, like a bite or anything on my body, it's from them. Um, they will make us bleed every single day, basically, when we work with them. Um, because, you know, they don't have hands, so they use their beak to explore what something is. Or like I, I mentioned to you before, we hand feed them every day. So, um, you know, they're going, it's just like with like a toddler gets really excited for food or something, starts like running around or something. They um, get really excited for their food sometimes, depending on what the fish is, and they'll start biting out of nowhere. They get impatient. Um, so they, they're very fun to work with, but they are definitely not the nicest animal that people think that they are. That's one of the most common questions I get asked, like if I'm just out there with them, they're like, oh, like, are they as nice as they seem? And I don't want to break people's hearts, but um, they're not that nice. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's funny. So I think actually, so you said Southwest coast of South Africa? Yes. Uh -huh. So that's like Cape Town type. Area. Yeah. So when I was in South Africa, when we were in Cape Town, we saw uh -huh. some penguins. So I guess it pro we're probably was them. them. Yeah. Maybe. So um, another reason why I like like the education aspect of it is because you learn a lot of things about animals that were technically like myths as well. So a big myth about penguins is that they all have to live in cold areas and that also that they're around polar bears. So a lot of people think that polar bears are one of their natural predators, but all species of penguins live below the equator. So they all live in the Southern hemisphere. And the only ones that live in cold temperatures are in Antarctica. And it's really only like four or five species of them that actually live there. All the other ones live in like Africa. I think some live like around like New Zealand or Australia. And then there are some in South America as well too. Um, Southern, like Argentina, south end of Argentina. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. um, so they, um, 
the bigger ones kind of live in the colder areas though. So that's why you see like the emperor penguins or the king penguins and stuff. They're the ones that live in Antarctica because they need more fat on their bodies to um, keep them warm and everything. Um, but there are other penguins that live in like around South Africa. There are Humboldt penguins that kind of look like African black footed penguins. Um, I think their markings are just like a little bit different. Um, you've probably heard of like the macaroni penguins before. Those are small ones that have like the yellow like mm -hmm. strips on their face and everything. Um, so those all ones, they all actually live in like warmer areas. Um, I'm jealous that you've gone to South Africa because one of my goals is to actually go to South Africa and volunteer with a conservation group that's down there that we actually work with at the zoo. It's called Sandcob and they do rescue and rehabilitation work with like coastal wildlife birds mm -hmm. down there. So they do a lot of work with the penguins. Yeah. If you get to go, you should, you should for sure go. <laughs> I spent like, um, like three weeks there and we traveled okay. through throughout the whole country. Uh -huh. Um, we started in Johannesburg, but then we spent probably a total of six of the days at different so we were at kruger for three and we were at i don't remember what the other one was called but we were at on safari for six days basically okay and like you know the um like the land rovers or whatever yeah that, uh -huh. we got in we saw like lions were like walking next to it and it was like i was like oh like an elephant stuck its trunk in into the car uh -huh. onto some lady's lap <laughs> she freaked out but yeah yeah man you should for sure go i highly 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 recommend it it's yeah. like in because there's there's a little bit of everything right like cape town yeah. is a very nice area uh -huh. and johannesburg has like western city vibe like okay. an american city for uh -huh. a, a little bit of it and then uh -huh. you go three blocks and it's like you're in like a village in africa and it's like uh -huh. so you learn a lot it's it's i don't know i got lucky we were with like a tour group Okay. type thing uh -huh. um so i don't know i like we never ended up in a situation where i was like we probably shouldn't be here at the moment yeah uh -huh. Uh -huh. um <laughs> but yeah no the people were all really nice it was like i learned a ton it was great to be there like three weeks like three weeks was a long time for sure but yeah uh -huh. we were moving from place to place every like three four days so okay. It was honestly, it was it was a really cool experience for sure. And when, once we got to Cape Town, uh -huh. um, one of the guys on the trip was like, "You want to go cage diving?" I was like, "No, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to go have a great white swim up next to me, dude." Like, it looks cool on TV, but I yeah, would probably uh -huh. I would probably crap myself if I was yeah. in the cage. No, I I feel that. Are you dive certified at all? No, no. <laughs> not even a, not even a little bit, dude. The extent of my water is like, I'll jump in the ocean and like yeah. body surf a couple waves, and, <laughs> and I know how to swim. Like I can swim in a pool. Uh -huh. Like I know how to swim, but like but past that, no, yeah, not, like no shot. Like I, I I would say, like one of um, I don't know if you saw the episode with um Garrett uh, Josemans. He's a quantum physicist. Okay. So he's also, I think he's scuba certified and currently he is in California somewhere going spearfishing. Um, and he popped up with some giant fish on his Instagram. <laughs> was like, he, he was at the gym doing like breath holding exercises. Oh my God. I was like, yeah. you're nuts, dude. Yeah. I got dive certified. So for our penguin pool, like I mentioned, it's 14 feet deep. So to mm -hmm. actually like clean it, we clean it once a month and we have to dive it to clean it. Oh yeah. So I did actually get dive certified through the job um but I was kind of the same way I had never done anything like that before so I was definitely like my anxiety was going like off the roof because it's 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 hard to convince yourself that you can breathe underwater like even if you know that you have like oxygen with you and everything like it's hard to actually convince your body that like I'm this deep down in the water and I can still breathe like completely fine and everything you know so yeah um but I, I would rather go scuba diving than like actually like deep sea diving. So I got my open water dive certification, which means I can dive anywhere in the world up to like, I think it was like 90 feet deep or something. Um, and like, that sounds really cool and everything. I just have no desire for that. <laughs> um, yeah. Scuba diving is like where I'm at for it. Yeah, no, for sure. Like I feel, do you know what snuba is? No. Snuba is like, it's like when you're snorkeling. Okay. But 
but you're hooked so but instead of that little like funnel thing they mm-hmm. give you an air hose back to the boat uh, okay and a weight belt but like okay. everything else is like snorkel uh-huh. and now i did very poorly with that like mentally because i'm very i'm comfortable in the water yeah. without like the like if if i had been in the exact same environment yeah. with just the hose uh-huh and not the weight belt like i'm Uh comfortable under like under the water for long periods of it's it's very odd like i can't really explain why or even like the other day when we were on vacation or like two weeks ago Uh we took um this is a boat tour after our friend after our friend's wedding and they anchored probably i don't know 100 yards offshore or something like that Mm -hmm. and jen and i just swam to the beach and like we're we're very comfortable doing that but it's once you get all the gear on then it's like kind of weird it's different yeah Yeah. we so we use a weight belt for our pool at the zoo but when i was getting dive certified we had um like the full-on like i can't remember the technical term for it but it's like almost that backpack and stuff that like you can inflate and like deflate and stuff so when we were swimming around like for that you would just deflate that and you would naturally sink and everything because you weren't bo- you weren't buoyant anymore. Um, so it was different to then come back to the zoo and not use that and use the weight belt because it was like as soon as you were in the water, you had to be prepared to be like moving around because you would be sinking, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Oh, wait, so you like working with penguins even though they're mean. Why? I do. I do. They, they are still one of my favorite animals, so I will continue to work with them if I can. Um, they're just, they're tiny and hateful. Um, but it's, I mean, if I was a penguin, I would probably be that way too. They, the biggest part is like, so we have, so we do breeding work with our penguins. So they are endangered out in the wild. So we are, like I was mentioning before, we are partnered with that sand cob group and we have approved breeding pairs. We have two approved breeding pairs, which means if those pairs laying egg and it's fergal and it hatches successfully, we'll either add that chick back to our colony or it will go to another zoo or aquarium to add some diversity to their colony. Um, and it's all to just keep the population strong so that one day when everything is hopefully, who knows if it'll ever actually get there or not, but hopefully out in the wild will be safer for them that we can start doing breeding work to release to the wild instead. Um, but their biggest thing is their food source. So penguins like to eat, these penguins like to eat sardines and anchovies. And since humans like to eat sardine, sardines and anchovies, they're actually being overfished. So there's not enough of their natural food source out in the wild to sustain all of them that are out there. So we can't release to the wild yet because we would just be adding more competition for food that already doesn't really exist in the first place. Um, But we have those two group breeding pairs, but then we have other pairs that are partnered up. We just don't use their eggs for anything. Most of the time they're not fertile, they're like chicken eggs, but they're all penguins that could be slightly related to each other. So that's the problem that you get when you have like um, situations like this where you do breeding, but you don't necessarily always send them out to other places. So if we keep adding ones to the same colony, then they can be genetically slightly, you know, related to each other. So if there's a pair that's too genetically similar, sand cob won't use them as an improved breeding pair because their genetics will not do well for the species moving forward or anything. Um, so I do really like working with them because they are kind of the species that we get to do a lot of our conservation work with as well. Um, we had a baby that was born. It's actually been the first baby since I've been there back in November. Her name is Betty White now, um, of course. <laughs> um, and she's about like eight months old now and so it like that's just a really cool thing to be a part of to see the penguins like from I was there the day that she hatched I was the one who found her with her parents and everything so it was just a really cool thing to be a part of to see you found so it wasn't like the egg popped out and then you like moved it to the usually you leave it there so oh, cool. right now, if they lay eggs, we do pull them and we put them in an incubator because it's too humid right now. Um, but we have a lot that our most common month for babies to hatch in is November because parents are laying them in like end of September, early October. 
And it makes sense because out in the wild, that would be their summertime since they're in the Southern hemisphere. So it makes sense. So as long as the parents don't reject the egg during those months, we will leave the egg on the nest with them. It takes about 30 so days, like a month or a month and a couple days for the egg to hatch. So we just check on it every day. We feed whoever is incubating it on the nest. We feed them on the nest every day. Um, and when they, when it gets to that day that they're expected to start hatching, we check on the egg a lot more. We don't ever pull it out. We just look at it. And once we see it starting to crack a little bit and everything, we're just constantly like watching it and everything. Because when the chick does hatch, we do have to pull it real quick to get a weight on it and make sure everything is okay with it. Yeah. But as long as the parents are okay to take with it, we leave, take care of it. Um, we leave the baby on the nest for about a month with the parents too. And then we have to pull them from the nest area after like a month if they're on there because the parents won't really take care of them anymore because they're too big, but they're not waterproof yet. And just because of the setup that we have, we can't leave them out on exhibit because there's that really big pool. So yeah. we can't leave them out there. So after about a month of them being on the nest, we do pull them and they live inside um for like a month or two until they it's called because they become fully fledged which means they get their waterproof feathers in um and then we start slowly like introducing them to the colony to make sure they get you know penguins are very social birds so there there's a hierarchy and everything so we have to watch them when they're getting introduced because like i mentioned they are jerks so they will fight each other and everything um and um, then we start teaching, like we start doing supervised swims with them to make sure they learn how to swim properly and everything. Um, so that whole process usually takes about like two months, month they're off the nest. And then after that, as long as they're good with the colony and they're eating fine, they're just part of the colony now. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. So is the, the baby that you found, is she's good to go? Yes, she is. She is still a baby, so she'll turn a year old in November. She still has her baby feathers, but they're waterproof, so um, she's out on exhibit and everything. She would technically be the lowest on the totem pole for them, um, but we have another penguin whose name is Dory, who was actually hatched with a form of scoliosis, and again going back to penguins being jerks they can pick up when something is different about one of them and so she is kind of the forever i won't say outcast because they don't pick on her 24 7 or anything but she kind of hangs out by herself most of the time she doesn't really hang out in the group that much um and she is the one that they'll kind of pick on the most if she is around mm. any of them um but if, if she wasn't there, then the baby, Betty White, would um, probably be a little bit more bullied than she is right now. Yeah. So what happens when, so when you take them out in the wild, how does that work for them while they're still, while they're not waterproof or whatever, like in the parents, how, how does that work? How does that stage work? So in the wild, for us, it's just because of the setup that we have. The nest boxes that we have for the approved breeding pairs are on exhibit, so they're not far from the water. Out in the wild, they um, there's actually a Netflix documentary. It's called um, Penguin Town. I don't know if you've heard of it. It came out like last year. Um, Pat and Oswald does like the narration for it and everything. Um, it's really good. It's only like eight episodes, but it's about this place in South Africa called Simon's Town. And um, it's where a lot of the black-footed penguins come up onto land every year and make their nests for breeding season. So they go away from like the ocean and everything when they make their nests. So the chicks will stay on the nest out in the wild until they can start swimming. Um, and the parents will actually then kick them off the nest when that happens and like make them go live on their own, basically. They'll stop taking care of them. But they have more space out in the wild so they can make their nests further away. So it's a not really a concern of the baby accidentally ending up in the water because they're not really near it. In the oh, it's more of an accident thing yes. rather than the parent. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. That makes uh -huh. sense. Uh -huh. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. All right. What is your favorite of the house or the favorite of the exhibits that you work in? What's your favorite one or favorite animal? Probably penguins. I do like as much as I talk shit about them and everything. Um, they 
like I mentioned, they have always been one of my favorite animals. My favorite penguin, his name is Vinny. He's about eight years old. He he likes me, so I like him. Um, we do use our penguins for ambassador programs too. So we'll bring them out. Like we'll bring them to our stage and everything for programs too. We don't use all of them for that. We have, we have 18 total and we only use like our non-breeding pairs as the ambassador ones. So he is one of them. So I'd use him most frequently. Um, but he, he tries to mate with me um so because he because he does that he doesn't try to hurt me ever which is very nice um so i can feel That's comfortable bringing him out for programs um i'm kind of like i kind of realized working this though like i kind of am like a bird person though so like the birds of prey are something that i'm like really happy i've gotten more experience working with i love like mammals and stuff um our armadillo is adorable he's really cool and everything but I don't know. There's just something about like you were talking about before, just like working with like a vulture or a bald eagle or hawk or something, you know, and just being like, I guess kind of like that close with something that you've only ever seen kind of like in the distance almost and just learning more about them just by working with them because they're not always the smartest, but they, um, there's still stuff you can learn about them every time and they can, they can do stuff that like, you wouldn't know about unless you know you worked with them or anything so yeah that makes sense okay so we we're going back to how you ended up here in the first place where we yeah. got sidetracked by penguins <laughs> <laughs> okay so you had your internship but before that when you were little was this something that you always wanted to be doing I did. Um, I didn't know at the time that I would want to be at a zoo. Um, I knew I didn't want to be a vet because um, I didn't think I could handle that kind of stuff. But, you know, besides just like going to a zoo growing up, you don't really know anything about how you can become like a zookeeper or anything. So I always liked, you know, the exotic animals growing up. I just never actually like knew if I would ever work with them. Um, but once I got into like high school and stuff and I did more research about it, I did kind of like learn more about how to get involved. And that was when I really started like moving like it was something that I could do um in the future as my career so it's it's a very it's a very rewarding job um it's very taxing because it's physical it's a physical job um so people don't always last in the field super super long because it, it does take a toll on your body and everything physically as well um and it's not a very well paying job either so it can be hard for people to use that as like their main career um as well but um, I just always, my favorite animals growing up were penguins and orangutans. So I just always liked the exotic animals growing up. So to be able to get involved with them, maybe not necessarily those specific species always, but be around them and stuff is always very rewarding to me. For sure. So what is, so you, when you had your internship, right? Uh -huh. have, you, have you worked with other interns since? So like you've seen people start like sort of come through the ranks, I guess, if you will. What is your uh, advice to those who maybe want to get into zoos or whatever, but don't know how? Um, one of the biggest things with this field too is like you do have to be move, like willing and able to kind of like move around um, to kind of progress. So there's not a lot of upward growth all the time at the same facility, unless you want to get up into like an administrative position. But for a lot of people, that's not what they want because you're not really working with the animals anymore. Um, so you do kind of have to like move around to other facilities like around the country if you're able to. So I kind of wish when I was younger, I kind of wish I looked into stuff more like that I could volunteer at as like a teenager or maybe even in college because like even in college we weren't that far from DC so like I could have done stuff at the National Zoo if I had the time. Um, so I think I've always been a career motivated person too so like once I knew that this was what I wanted to do I wasn't really going to settle for less either and so I think just kind of being determined for it and just like not second guessing your abilities for it so even if you don't necessarily have the hands-on experience I still tell people to apply for something if they're interested in it because the worst thing that can happen is just being told no um, but you won't find out unless you 
Um, you'll only find out if you apply for it. Um, internships and volunteering are the easiest way to get into the field. Um, if you go to a college that has like zoology or stuff like that, that can be a good way to get into it. Um, I had some coworkers down in New Orleans who went to LSU and they um, have like, um, it's not like a zoo itself, but they have an animal program at that college where they worked with animals while they were there too. So that got them hands-on experience. There's at least two, they're called teaching zoos. There's one in Florida and I think there's one in California and they are like schools that you can go to that, um, I think it counts as a four-year degree. I'm not 100% sure because I had some coworkers who did it, but um, there's one that's called like the Teaching Zoo of America, and you work with animals while you're there. Like, I think you can get your degree there as well, but you work with animals like the whole time that you're there as well. So like, you, even after you, when you come out of college right away, you have hands-on experience as well. So I always tell people just like do their research if they really know what they're interested in to like do your research because there are options out there. Um, it is just kind of like a general warning that like in all the internships and stuff are usually unpaid. Um, we're all trying to fight for internships in the zoo field to become paid because we do think that creates like a lack of diversity and a lack of um, interest almost in the field because if people can't afford to do an unpaid internship, they don't even think about it really as an option in the first place either, even if it is something that they're interested in. So we're trying to do stuff from the ground up in the field of we're trying to go to our facilities and be like, look, like, so we have interns currently at the zoo right now, and this is the first year that they're doing a stipend for them. So they got a $2,000 stipend, which isn't a lot, definitely could be bigger, but it's at least something to start from now. So we're all kind of hoping that this is the general direction that the volunteering and internships will go in the field as well. Um, but yeah, I usually say research. If you have the time and capability to volunteer internship, that's one of the best ways for networking as well to get into it too. Hands-on experience then, for sure. Yeah, hands-on experience. And then just not like, don't like self-doubt on yourself either. Like even if you feel like you don't really have the hands-on experience, a lot of the stuff, like personally with our department right now, we care about hiring for experience, but we also care about hiring for personality. So we wanna make sure that the people that we're hiring can work well on the team that we have. So obviously we wanna hire someone who has some good experience, but also has a great personality, but a lot of areas like ambassador departments at places too can be good um, steps into the field. So they can be good ways for someone like new to come into the field too. So there are entry level positions in zoos that you can come in at as well. Um, which means obviously you don't have to have that much experience for them either. So biggest thing I always tell people too, is even like, if you're interested in it, just apply for it because you never know what will happen with it either. Yeah. hundred percent. 100%. That's how it is with, that, with everything. That's how yeah, I get uh -huh. half the guests on here. It's like, I uh -huh. don't know if they are down to do it unless I message them. And then if they say no, it's the same as if I didn't message them anyway. So I yeah. might as well uh -huh. do it. Uh -huh. You're only going to find out if you ask. So <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So um, a couple more things. I think uh -huh. your Instagram, you've got tons of cool pictures on there. So if people want to find you, uh -huh. I'll put the link in the description. But okay. Um, you should definitely go check out Greg's Instagram because he's got, like you mentioned earlier, the picture of the bald eagle. Mm -hmm. Animals are all over the place on there. Um, and it's a good way to, I think, at least for me, I've been able to like keep tabs on on what you've been doing because it's very, like you do a good job of documenting, I guess, the, what, what you're working with and and kind of like this is, I think, I don't remember what exactly what the caption is, but you're like, this is a bald eagle and it uh -huh. does this, this, and this. And it's uh -huh. like it's like a mini uh educational show yeah without the show so yeah. if you're interested in animals and, yeah. and go find it i mean well i'll put the link in the description but it's, <laughs> it's really cool that you're doing that i think I've, yeah. have, have people told you that before or not really are you, or I, you just post um, it because you like it i i do it mostly because i like it because i do i mean we are in the 21st century so i do think social media is a great way for stuff like that um, hearing that from you is awesome to hear because I want, that's what I do. Like, I never want to just post a picture of myself holding like a bald eagle or working with a penguin or anything like that, just to make it seem like I have a really cool job or something like that. Like, yeah, yes, it's a, it's a really cool job, but I want 
I want people to learn from it as well. Like there are, like we've talked about this whole time, like you see these birds and stuff flying around down in the wild, but you might not know necessarily everything about them besides the basics. Or like you might not know that there's something small that you can do to help them stay safe out in the wild as well. Um, so I always try to add in some general stuff about each animal that I post, but then also conservation stuff as well too, because, um, I mean, that's what we're here for, you know, we're not, we're not going into work every day and being like, let's show off by just walking around this bald eagle, you know, around the zoo and everything. Like we want, we want people to get excited about like animals that yes, they can see out in the wild, but also excited about things that they can do to help with them too. So I think social media is really good for that as well. I don't know um, if you're very active on, so I personally don't have a TikTok like I have a Twitter. I don't, I don't either. Yeah. Um, I have a Twitter account and I'm not like, I don't really post anything on there, but there's this girl who um, works at a farm. I don't remember where it is, but she's been blowing up on TikToks like recently because she works at a farm. She has like emus, she has cows, she has, um, you know, all like geese, she has deer, like stuff. And she was posting these videos on TikTok, like trying to talk about the animals that she have, but in all those videos, you know, those animals are coming up and messing with her phone. So she's like yelling at them and like having these like, you know, like she's like talking to them basically, you know, and they're really funny. Um, but um, I think it's a great tool to have a lot of zoos have like Instagram accounts, they have Facebook accounts, they have um, some even have TikToks, like the bigger zoos, like I'm sure the Smithsonian Zoo has one, San Diego probably has one. And it's a good way to get like a new generation like interested in everything too. Mm -hmm. So like growing up, we had, you know, Vine and everything. And I loved <laughs> Vine growing up. I don't think TikTok has anything on Vine personally myself. No, but no shot. Vine, yeah. Vine, Vine will never be beaten. No, exactly. <laughs> but it's like the same kind of thing, you know, if Vine had stayed around longer, I think zoos would have hopped on Vine more than like TikTok or something. Cause it's, it's a way to get, the education out there still to because it's also a good way to get education out there to people who can't necessarily come to the facility too yeah for sure so, have you thought about reels like um when you're doing your show you have somebody like record little bits and you can just pop it up as a reel that's actually a really good idea i have not thought about that no might yeah. as well i put <laughs> some of the soccer ones like for no yeah. i have one of this one of my soccer ones has like twenty one thousand views for no yeah. reason uh -huh. <laughs> I, I don't even just, think it's my best one it's like it's just there i was like i don't know why this is doing what it is but it happens to have done well but yeah happened. that's a, yeah yeah that's another way to get things out there like yeah uh, and you i don't need youtube shorts as well so i've started to do that yeah. with um the podcast but the soccer oh, yeah. ones the uh -huh. soccer ones have been doing i've been doing pretty well so yeah um i think it's, it's a good. way to to get stuff out there like yeah. that, like with the soccer stuff i'm doing the soccer stuff for a very similar reason for that you are for what you're doing it's like you want to help the next generation like yeah. be as best prepared they can be for whatever they're going to go into and so yeah. it just i don't know seems to have been working i don't know how the algorithm works i don't think anyone <laughs> does to be totally honest but <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. no i agree it's like it's short content to, you know, so if it's stuff that people can be interested in, but it doesn't take up too much of their time because we live in such a fast paced world now too, that people don't have time to always just sit down and even maybe even watch like a five minute video about something. People don't always have the time for that. That's why podcasts are so cool because you can have educational talks and everything or even just talk about whatever the hell you want to talk about, but people can listen to them while they're doing something. So yes, they're longer, but like, like I told you, I will listen to them sometimes when I'm at work because I'm behind the scenes. So while I'm cleaning in the morning, I'll pop my AirPods in and I'll listen to some of them and everything because it's, it's a, it's a nice way to like do what you want to do, but also still learn more about other stuff too. Yeah, for sure. I asked, um, I asked Aisha this because she said that she listens to this one sometimes as well. Uh -huh. And you said you did. So but thank you also very oh. much for that. Um, how has it been being like, and this is not meant to be like uh, you're on my podcast, but like <laughs> you, like people have podcasts that they listen to and uh -huh. then like to be a guest on it. Like I've not actually experienced that. So like, what, yeah. what is it? I'm actually out of curiosity. Like, what is it? What is it like for you? Like, 
Well, I don't want to like brag or anything, but what part of our job that we do too is we actually do like news programs and stuff for educational stuff. So like I've done technically like I've been on TV and stuff with animals and stuff before I've done live programs on mm -hmm. new segments. I've done tape ones and everything. So I wouldn't say necessarily the feeling is anything super like new to me in the sense that like right. I didn't feel like prepared for it. But I, personally for me, they're just fun. It's a fun yeah. thing to be a part of because I mean, it's very casual. It's just like a conversation you do a really good job about being interested in the stuff that the people that you're talking to work in are interested in as well too. And that's what you want from someone who does something like this. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, um, I, I, I try. I don't want to sound, <laughs> go sound stupid because then no, that would, and that would I mean, be I know, I know a lot of people who try to do podcasts and stuff. Like there was a time a couple months ago where it seemed like everyone was trying to pop up with like their own podcasts if they didn't have like yeah. too much going on or something. Um, and I think like yours is very genuine and it's like it it sticks with people you know so to be able to come on to something like that it makes me feel like I am doing something good in the world as well kind of too you know because it's something that I hope people are interested in as well but if it's even just an interesting like you know there are podcasts out there that are like murder mystery or true crime podcasts so you know people are listening to those for the entertainment so people tuning into this one for the entertainment that's completely fine because i need the entertainment as well so i don't um i don't knock that or anything but it's also it feels very genuine and everything too so it's a good environment good that's good to hear because i don't have i don't get a lot of feedback generally like um my like the number like the views and everything aren't big enough that i have people in the comments saying yeah. this and that although the comments is like its own section of hell generally. <laughs> so but but i don't get a lot of um feedback from like i have no idea who actually listens yeah like at all mm -hmm. except for like if somebody went on and i know that they sent it to like their friend and, like yeah. their friend uh -huh. listened to that one but, uh -huh. like i have no idea who actually listens to it consistently so yeah. like when you told me that i was like big win <laughs> <laughs> so, well, yeah, that's I, awesome. I just think it's cool too in general like, i like learning about stuff that i don't know that much about in the first place too so like if i can do that for people through this one like i think that's really cool the guy I want to learn about like what other people are doing in their lives and how that factors into everything and what they're able to achieve as well. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of why I ended up here because it, it ended up being like, it's a lot easier to say to somebody that I haven't talked to in a while, Hey, do you want to come on the pod? Like if I want yeah. to talk to you about, I wouldn't message you and be like, Hey Greg, can I talk to you about your job for an hour and a half? You'd be yeah. like, no, oh, that's weird. And it's like, <laughs> Hey, Hey Greg, you want to come on the podcast? And he's like, yeah. Oh Yeah. Yeah. So for me, it's almost the same conversation, like, yeah. and then I just record it and put it on the, on the internet, which is yeah. what happened with uh, Sammy and Izzy in the, all the way back episode one, uh -huh. we were having lots of conversations about, um, I was when George Floyd was killed and we were having lots of conversations about that. And he was like, why don't you just record it and put it on the internet? Like you're yeah. asking good questions. You're doing yeah. this, you're doing that. And I was like, I could. <laughs> <laughs> and I, here I we are now. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's crazy how things change. Uh -huh. Oh, wild. But no, also you've given great answers as well. Like there's a, um, there's a, the answers you give lead into other things. And that's really what's important. Especially when you have, like, I think I've learned to become good at that over the course of me doing this, but sometimes, and so I can ask questions that lend you to talk about multiple different things that can mm -hmm. lend it, but you do a good job of that anyway. So it's, mm -hmm. it's very very comfortable this was a very natural one I, it I was feel like, yes. so uh -huh. and you ask very good questions so it's not like you it doesn't ever feel like you're just coming on here and being like so just talk to me or something like that like obviously it's a natural conversation but you ask questions that are show that you care and like you did yeah. you did research and everything you're not just like oh i know nothing about this let me just bring you on here to just like have them talk about it you actually like care about what the people are doing too yeah for sure that's why i hate just the interview like question one what is yeah. your favorite job like, uh -huh. those are so i can't do that and sometimes yeah. when i have done a couple where it ended up being like that mm -hmm. um sometimes through my own lack of knowledge but other times just through like that's the way that the conversation went and that is less less fun 
yeah i come away with those like eh, yeah afterwards <laughs> you know but and they're but, not I don't feel like they're fun to listen to either at that point either because you can tell that it's very robotic like it's very scripted almost you know yeah exactly yeah for sure and it's I mean I've never not put one out so yeah and I, and I don't intend like un- unless it's something like horrible like I'm never gonna I'm never gonna not do that Be- just yeah. because like it there's always something to be learned like I go it's- through even like it might not be worth the time to go through an hour and a half conversation to find one tidbit, but like, yeah, it is. So there's always something like a piece of a tidbit here, a tidbit there or something mm-hmm. like, Oh, I didn't think about that that way, mm-hmm. but, mm-hmm. um, all right. So what is, what is next for you? Right. So you're doing the ambassador stuff yeah, and, and you've been, you were doing that at uh, in New Orleans as well, and now you're yes. in, in Little Rock and still doing it. And so, do you have any desire to go um, work with? I'm, I'm going to use this as the example, but any desire to go work with like the big cats or like like in the primates? Like, you still want to do that? Or yeah. like, are you good? Like, I don't like what do you want to explore everything? Or like, you're very happy here for the moment? Or like, because I don't know how the zoo. I don't want to call it an industry because it's <laughs> not that it's not that anymore anyways. Yeah. But like, I don't know how it works. So like, what are the options there? You, so just like anywhere you can get raises, obviously. So if you stay long enough somewhere, you will get raises in that sense. So that is an extensive to stay places sometimes, but it really is just based on what you want. So right now I am very happy being in like ambassador departments. I really like the variety and I like the amount of education like I get to do along with it still um down the line i might be more interested in moving into like a set group like primates um my ultimate goal is actually to work at the san diego zoo because my i've been there a couple times it's like the harvard of zoos basically so like that it's kind of a cliche thing to want but like it um it's an area that I would want to live in. My parents want to retire out there. So it would make, have me like live by them again as well. Um, but they offer lots of different things too. So it, I'm kind of slowly making my way there. I'll be in Low Rock for a couple of years because they have really good um, retirement benefits here. So I want all that money um, before I leave. <laughs> um, but I'll probably be here for like, three or four more years. Um, I'm happy in my department. I'm happy with the animals I get to work with. I'm happy with the zoo and everything. Um, and then after that, I'll start looking to move somewhere else, whether or not still in ambassadors, I don't know. I don't really have any primates experience. So that would be something that I would have to look into trying to get, or like maybe like volunteering somehow if I can. Um, when I was down in New Orleans before COVID hit, I did actually start volunteering with our primate department down there while I worked my outreach job um but I was I only did that for like two months before COVID hit so I didn't get that much experience from it and primates are a big thing to work with because they're technically code red animals so they can't cause damage and everything you have to be it's all protected contact and everything um so I would have to probably get some experience with them somehow some way um but yeah, I think I'm like slowly moving out west and just kind of bouncing around to facilities. I don't have a problem moving around. Eventually, I would want to stay somewhere long term. Um, but I right now, I'm just kind of moving around to get as much experience as I can get, basically. Even like we have different animals here in the ambassador department that I work with and I would have worked with that, that I worked with down in New Orleans. So like their penguins are in their ambassador department. So I get the experience with penguins by being at this ambassador department. So just kind of trying to find those small differences for the sections that I'm applying for when I'm applying in the future, too. Yeah. Makes sense. We've been chatting for almost two hours now. <laughs> it's flown by. It really and, has. <laughs> and you, sir, have COVID. So I do have COVID. Yeah, <laughs> I told you I need the entertainment. So maybe <laughs> for, today was my first day of quarantine. I've got um. So I normally work Tuesday through Saturday, but you know, with the current uh, guidelines and stuff, you quarantine for five days, and then if your symptoms, if you don't have symptoms anymore. Or if your symptoms are getting better, you can return to work. You just have to um, mask, wear your mask um, for like an additional five or 10 days. 
So our safety officer was talking to me about that this morning over the phone and everything, but I'm off technically Sundays and Mondays. So there's really no point of me going back before Tuesday anyway. So I needed some face-to-face -face, um, entertainment today at least because it's going to be a very slow next uh, five or six days. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, I feel like this is a good place to wrap it up. Um, I really appreciate your time. I'm not, not that you're uh, short on time at, at, the, at, the, at the moment, but yeah, I have nowhere to be. <laughs> um, but yeah, really, I learned a ton, obviously, right? Where we talked about the interest of birds of prey before, so that was cool to hear about all that stuff. And I think yeah. generally, just like, I don't, I don't think people have an understanding of how zoos really work, just yeah. unless they're in, I, and but I will, I will say though all the zoos that I've been to in the last five years have done a really good job of saying like, we're in the conservation business. We're doing yes. this, like, and this is why this animal's here because yeah. it was injured and we're rehabbing it and it can't go back to the wild for X, Y, Z reasons. And, yeah. and it's a been a point of universal emphasis, I'd say, yeah. um, at least in my experience. So, but yeah, dude, it was, it was great. Learned a ton. So Thank really you. appreciate your time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um all right i guess with that guys we will see you guys next time peace